Coming up on Market to Market. After a sluggish start, the rural economy gets moving. Congress gets the Fed's view of the nation's economic future. And breaking barriers is all in a day's work for this cattle industry maverick. Those stories and market analysis with Ted Seifert, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, July 17 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Americans cut back on fine dining and trips to the mall last month, indicating they remain cautious despite healthy job growth. According to the Commerce Department, retail sales fell three-tenths of a percent in June, the weakest showing since last February, when weather kept shoppers indoors. The Labor Department says the Consumer Price Index rose three-tenths of a percent last month in light of higher prices in the grocery aisle and at the pump. When the volatile food and energy sectors are removed, the core index increased only two-tenths of a percent. Housing starts hit their highest level in 28 years as recent news of more jobs and the pay that goes with them gave construction companies incentive to build more houses and apartments. And a deal curtailing Iran's access to fissionable nuclear material brought an ever-so-brief boost to oil prices. However, the notion of increased worldwide output sent crude to a three-month low, only to bounce back at week's end on Greek economic news. Despite relatively flat inflation numbers, the Federal Reserve Board has made it clear they plan to raise interest rates to banks later this year. But in revelations to the Senate Banking Committee this week, Fed Chair Janet Yellen said board members want to be reasonably sure inflation is on its way up to 2 percent before making a move. The needle on the inflation meter has been hovering around zero since the beginning of the year. But news from the heartland indicates the needle is starting to move upward. The Midwest economy may be on the upswing. That's according to a survey of non-urban bankers released this week from Creighton University. The rural Main Street Index, compiled by the Omaha-based Economics Department, climbed above growth neutral for the first time since January, hitting its highest mark in more than a year. The 53.4 reading was driven mostly by improving crop prices. This also marked the fourth consecutive month of growth in the survey. Ernie Goss conducts the monthly snapshot that is based on data from 10 midsection states bankers dependent on agriculture and energy. Even the farm and ranch land sector saw some improvement last month. However, the rate for this element of the survey is still below growth neutral. Farm equipment sales are improving, albeit tepidly from June's record low level. This factor in the survey has been below the growth neutral point for 24 straight months. Goss says the expectation of lower farm income again is keeping producers in the cautious category when it comes to purchases. As crop prices stage a recovery, Goss believes some businesses in rural America are adding jobs. Nationally, the picture is improving, according to the nation's chief financial officer. Federal Reserve Board Chair Janet Yellen addressed lawmakers this week, saying some sluggishness involving transitory factors like weather, the West Coast port issues, and other statistical noises are waning. The available data suggests a moderate pace of GDP growth in the second quarter as these influences dissipate. Notably, consumer spending is picked up and sales of motor vehicles in May and June were strong suggesting that many households have both the wherewithal and the confidence to purchase big-ticket items. And Yellen says the economic tailwinds of a lower dollar and oil prices should help net exports, thus leading to gradually lower unemployment. Looking forward, prospects are favorable for further improvement in the U.S. labor market and the economy more broadly. This week, the U.S. House passed legislation to bring more water to California's salad bowl in light of the four-year-old drought. The measure would direct more water to be taken from the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta. 
similar legislation has failed twice before. Democrats are opposed to the idea, and President Obama would likely veto the legislation if it made it to his desk. Facing problems like drought are part of the joy and pain that comes with a career in agriculture. The hope is always that hard work, whether it's growing crops or raising cattle, will bring a profit and provide consumers with food for their tables. And as producer Colleen Krantz found out earlier this year, one rancher looked past the ups and downs of raising cattle and pushed forward, despite everything that stood in the way. Paul Yeager explains. A new painting was hung last fall among 350 others, portraying the most influential leaders in the nation's livestock industry over the last century. This time, however, the face in the painting is that of a woman, only the second ever included in the elite saddle and sirloin portrait gallery. I don't think I ever gave it a thought. It's just what I wanted to do, and so I just did it. What Minnie Lou Bradley of Childress County, Texas did in 1955 was step into a man's world of cattle ranching. The boys have got to hunt all the draws and canyons for the cattle and get them bunched. At the time, only a fraction of ranchers were female. Bradley balks, however, when others describe her as a crusader for women. As she sees it, she simply chose a career and made a go of it on cheap, drought-plagued land in the Texas Panhandle. We will have owned this ranch 60 years come November. We bought it in 1955. We came on up here and the tumbleweeds were just right up to the windows of that old house. And so we started going out to the pastures. <laughs> it looked pretty bleak to me. Bradley, who at 83 still runs Bradley Three Ranch with her daughter Mary Lou Bradley Henderson and son-in-law James Henderson, remembers how she had to prove herself among the old school cowboys. She was just a few years beyond having become the first woman to earn an animal husbandry degree at Oklahoma State University, then called Oklahoma A&M, when she began ranching. One day, she helped vaccinate castrate and dehorn calves with a group of cowboys. And when her father-in-law, Rusty Bradley, mm -hmm. gave her the opportunity to share her opinion, Minnie Lou didn't hesitate. I said, the most cruel thing I ever saw in my life. And he said, what? And I said, dehorning these cattle. I've never seen a calf dehorn. You know, that blood just squirting everywhere. He said, what? I said, that is brutal. And an old, old cowboy sitting there, and of course, we've lost that breed, but they carried you high about everything. I mean, you had to really, you know, defend yourself. And he said, what's just what would you do? You gonna let the horns grow on them? Cause bruises? I said, no, I'd buy an Angus bull. Gaining confidence in Minnie Lou, Rusty Bradley wrote her a check that day, telling her to bring him five Angus bulls, a breed without horns. At the time, Angus cattle were not popular in that part of Texas, and most ranches ran Hereford cattle. While her father-in-law backed her ideas and encouraged her, other men in the area questioned her career choice and her clothing, which was anything but traditional. Walking into a rural store one day wearing her cowboy hat, boots, and the pistol her relatives insisted she carry in case of rattlesnakes, she overheard the conversation of a group of cotton growers. They weren't talking to me, but they were talking loud enough that, you know, I could hear them. And they said, can you imagine a woman horseback like she goes, blah, 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 you know. I just turned around and I said, I'd rather do that and have on a, an old cotton dress and stomping that cotton in that cotton trader all day long. You know, because that was all right with them for their wives to work like that, you know. Bradley began selling beef directly to small grocers and individuals in the 1970s. In 1986, she and daughter Mary Lou set up a meatpacking plant, B3R Country Meats in Childress, Texas. And it wasn't long before her daughter urged Minnie Lou to expand their market to urban areas. She said, do you know there's more people in a block in New York City than there is in three counties here? And so I'm going where the mouths are. Mary Lou's direct approach and Texas mannerisms resonated with those in the city, 
and the plant began selling directly to wholesale grocers, emphasizing health food. The B3R brand became so well recognized that its steaks were served at one of George W. Bush's post-inaugural celebrations. For a time, the plant provided meat for the certified Angus Beef's natural product line. Eventually, though, outside offers became too enticing, and the family sold the meatpacking company in 2002. In the ensuing years, Minnie Lou added other credits to her bio. She became the first female president of the influential American Angus Association and was inducted into the National Cowgirl Hall of Fame. I believe when Minnie Lou went through school, and, and also when I did, not maybe to the extreme, I do think women were in agriculture possibly it wasn't okay to be as good as, you had to be better than. But because of women like Minnie Lou, it isn't that way today. Late last year, fellow cattle producer Wesley Bonner wrote of Minnie Lou Bradley, 25 years ago, many in the industry thought her to be a niche market renegade, only to later appreciate her as a visionary. Despite those accolades, cattle production has been anything but easy. In the spring of 2014, the drought that plagued parts of Texas for much of the past four years almost brought an end to Bradley 3 Ranch. Grain prices were high and pasture conditions worsened with each passing day, prompting neighbors to call their herds. Minnie Lou's daughter, an accountant by trade, talked to her about the books. She said, I don't know how long we can keep going. And I said, Mary Lou, we said we wouldn't sell this cow herd. And she said, well, you know, there comes a time when you have to do something. And May the 23rd, it started raining. <laughs> Although the Texas panhandle is still locked in drought, many lose worries eased as the grass return. When she was recognized by her peers in the fall of 2014 at the North American International Livestock Exposition, Minnie Lou was praised for her intellect, vision, and courage. Thanks to the timely rains that saved the ranch, she would likely add luck to the list. And despite her many honors, Minnie Lou humbly extols the work of others. After you go down to the Cowgirl Hall of Fame and you read about some of those ladies are here, an inductee, I haven't done anything. Those gals were tough. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. Cheaper grain in foreign markets, a stronger dollar, and predictions of good weather all served to push the grain market lower. For the week, September wheat fell 22 cents, while the nearby corn contract was off 15 cents. Soybeans added to last week's losses as good weather and cheaper foreign product pushed the August contract 17 cents lower. Nearby meal prices were contrary again this week and moved 550 per ton higher. In the softs, December cotton fell for the third week in a row, losing 30 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, August Class 3 milk futures fell 56 cents. The livestock sector was mixed as the August cattle contract lost 83 cents. Nearby feeders gained nearly $4. And the August lean hog contract rose 202. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained nearly two ticks. Crude oil continued its downward slide, closing $2 per barrel lower. Comex Gold followed suit with a loss of $26 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index declined more than 10 and a half points to settle at 404.70. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Ted Seifert. Ted, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. We're glad to have you. Let's jump into this wheat market right off the bat. 22 cents down on the week. Yeah. Talk us through what's happening. Uh, a combination of things. From a technical standpoint, we were creating a, a, a bull flag or a bull pennant. Uh, this week we broke out of the downside of that. We were flirting with it at the end of last week. When we did that, that's causing technical selling, uh, a lot of the funds getting out of long positions, moving away from that. But the underlying fundamentals that are kind of causing this is that we were looking at uh, a, a bunch of potential concerns for this wheat market going into the, the growing season for some other areas in the world. We were looking at Australia in particular with the El Nino uh, as potentially having a, a tough growing season for wheat this year. So far, that hasn't been the case. And if you look at the extended forecast right now, still looking pretty good for them. Uh, Germany's improved. 
uh, crop scouts in Russia and the Ukraine, it's all coming back pretty favorable. Uh, and with the stronger dollar on top of that, uh, and for the fact that we keep losing out on tenders and we keep seeing subpar export sales, it's just a, a lot of bearish fundamentals kind of built on the market this week and broke us through that, and then you get the technical selling on top of that. Now, you, you talk about losing some tenders this week. It was reported that uh, Mexico made a, a substantial purchase of wheat, and Mexico's our neighbor. Yeah. It, it, I mean, is, it, is the U.S. dollar that much of a factor that it's now cheaper for, for Mexico to import overseas wheat than it is drive it across the border? Well, absolutely. Cheap shipping is the other thing, too. Uh, but yeah, that, that was, that was a, sort of a blow for the Mexico thing. Uh, but yes, it absolutely is. The, that dollar has been strong, and if you look at the, the grain markets, wheat is the one that is the most sensitive to the dollar because there's so many other uh, countries in the world that have wheat for export. Uh, corn, not as much because we're the main global exporter of corn. Uh, soybeans kind of fall in the middle of that, that spectrum, but wheat is the most dollar sensitive of the three. Now looking at the Chicago wheat market, don't have enough kerns concerns yet with weather in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois to, to give that thing any life. It's We're still just looking at burdensome stocks. Well, yes, we're looking at the big ending stocks that we ended up with last, at the end of last year. Those stocks uh, continue to get bigger up until the end and, and you know, when we, we hit our, our marketing year end. Uh, and we look at exports, we look at everything. And if the demand's really not there, it really doesn't matter if we take a little bit of a step back on production uh, because we do have some big carryovers at the moment. All right. Well, now let's jump into the corn market, down 14 and a half cents on the week. Yeah. Big move downward. Is this a, a change in fundamental tone like the wheat market, or is this a step back in your opinion? I think it's a step back, and let's see what happens from here to some extent. Uh, you did have that technical, a lot of people calling it a key reversal on Tuesday where we made a new high and then closed below the previous day's low. We were down 13 cents. Technically speaking, that was not a key reversal because that wasn't a contract high. The contract high was from about two years ago. Now, it was a multi or year and a half high, so it, you can call it, the technical term is an outside sweeping down day. Uh, and with that, that is a technical sell signal. So your, your fund buyers that have been going, kind of uh, having a field day in corn yep. the last few weeks, took a step back this week. Uh, but also weather. I mean, weather looks to be getting better. Crop conditions on a national scale haven't continued to drop, although they have in some pretty key st uh, states. We'll have to watch that again right. this coming week after getting some major rains in Illinois and Indiana again. Right, and Illinois Missouri. and Indiana. And that's that's one of the things, we, we did get a, a number of great questions on Twitter and Facebook. We encourage all of you to ask any questions you want us to, to have with our analysts. Send them in on Twitter and Facebook. This one was one that you saw and responded to on Twitter. I thought it was a great question this year. Uh, Steve in Virginia uh, is curious, I want to know if Illinois is having a bad year or if it's a bad year for Illinois. In your opinion, how tough could yields get Indiana, Illinois, Ohio. Yeah, no, I absolutely saw that question. Steve, how you doing? Uh, I made careful not to answer it though because I wanted to save it for this. And um, he worded it very well. Is this a, a bad year for Illinois or is this a bad year, basically? Uh, and, and I'm gonna answer that with, it's a bad year for Illinois, uh, but it's not a bad, bad crop in Illinois. There are certainly spots that are, that are really tough. Uh, the record we set in Illinois last year, we're not gonna get anywhere near that. Uh, I think we're going to be a bit below average, but I don't know if it's a complete disaster. We still have some weather left this weekend and next week are very key uh, as we go through pollination, so we'll see. Uh, but it, it, it's been a rough year. It's very, very variable. You see some wonderful, wonderful crops down in central uh, from Bloomington sort of eastward, and you see some really tough <clears throat> things up in northern Illinois and uh, southern, e southeast, uh, southwestern Illinois as well. So it's very variable. It's really kind of tough to get a handle on, uh, but it's not a disaster. Okay. Now, last time you were on, you were talking uh, roughly 160, 159 for a yield projection. Is that still where Ted Seifert's at today? Is that what you're thinking? We currently have three balance sheets for corn running uh, uh, 158 to 162. Okay. 158, 159, and 162. Um, we're at 162 for our official projections right now in our official balance sheet. Uh, but I've been talking about 159 since we started, since before we started planting, just doing st statistical analysis on what happens the year after we set a record. And on average, uh, if you look at 2002, 2009, you know, what, what do we do in the following years? Uh, on average, we were 11 to 12 bushels an acre off that previous record. That would put us right at that 159. So that's kind of what I thought we would see, especially with, with uh, 
us wanting to spend a little bit less money on this crop going into it. Right. Uh, now with all the problems that we've had, we've sort of been forced to spend more money on it, but the price has responded as well, so that's helped. Well, and that's that suits us up for our next question. We have spent more money than a lot of folks put on their, their projections yeah. here, meeting with their bankers. Given that we've had a rally, where's is this a sell point? Do producers let it put another dime on, or do you go ahead and lock in some prices now? Well, I, I think that we might have turned the corner on weather at this point, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a bit of a bigger pullback here in corn. We also have the, the sort of technical uh, setup for something like that as well. Uh, in fact, if you go back to 93, a lot of people want to equate this to 93, which I don't for uh, a number of reasons. But uh, if we want to use that as an, as an analog year, we hit our highs during the growing season uh, in July 9th. Okay. You know, uh, so we could see a pullback from here because maybe the worst of the weather is behind us. However, I do kind of think that we could continue to gain strength post-harvest and into January okay. and February, which is when we hit our highs in 93. Um, so I, I'm, I think very likely the floor has been raised unless we have some big issues on the demand side of the equation. Um, I do think you get a bit of a pullback here. I was encouraging guys to sell cash corn mm -hmm. uh, earlier this week and last week. Um, but I think, you know, I don't mind the idea of reowning bushels that have been sold previously, even okay. for this current marketing year, on a bigger pullback, too. All right. Well, let's jump right into the soybean market. Uh, we've talked a lot about supply. Missouri is hard, Illinois, southern Iowa. We've had a lot of supply concerns. Um, let's talk demand yeah. a little bit. Where do you see demand headed? We're down on soybean exports. Yeah. Are we going to pick them back up? Yeah, my concern is certainly Chinese demand here this year for soybeans. And this is a longer term thing. You know, in the near term, we have to kind of focus on the supply issue, which is a big question mark right now. Uh, and we have to kind of operate under the, the idea that the last three years where the USDA had demand at this point of the year, it came in sharply higher by the time we got to the end of the marketing season. So I think we kind of have to go under that operation. However, I really am very concerned about Chinese demand uh, again, as you mentioned, export sales are, are really off the pace of what we had seen the last three years. Uh, it, it really makes you wonder if, you know, after the double drought scenario that we had in 2012 with South America followed by our drought, they really had to dip into their reserve stocks and pretty much deplete them. Uh, same thing with corn. Uh, corn, they were able to build them back up a lot quicker because there's more corn to be had. Uh, it's taken them three years in soybeans, and you wonder if maybe that cycle is over okay. uh, and if they're sort of full up with beans now at this point. If that's the case, I'm very concerned that the Chinese only have about two-thirds of the demand that they've had, say, this marketing season, mm -hmm. this okay. marketing year. So prices, do you think we're going to downtrend into harvest here or wait and see what this weather does? Well, I, I think for soybeans, weather going forward is a okay. huge question mark. We've got a lot of stuff that's behind. Uh, it would take near-perfect weather going forward to really get that those bean con conditions back up. Uh, and get that big, good bean crop on, on still record acres, even with okay. losing some. Uh, but again, would take perfect weather. Soybeans do are, are the one that do have the chance to come back, though. So we'll see with okay. that. Uh, but like I said earlier, I mean, if we continue to have our, our, our issues here and there with soybeans, and we still are, are seeing conditions either stay the same or drop, uh, again, I think we need to factor in the idea that demand is going to be stronger. That's the idea that we've we should seen. have at this point. All so right. could still see more upside between now and middle August. Okay. Well, now let's jump into the livestock markets. Uh, uh, live cattle holding fairly steady. Have we hit a point where we can, uh, we're balancing supply and demand here? Yeah. The concern with live cattle uh, recently has been with the Canadians and a similar situation to what we had in 2012. A lot of cattle going to market, a lot of competing uh, beef coming into the country. So we've had our pullback there. <clears throat> From this point forward, I think we can start to stabilize a little bit. Uh, feeder cattle are going to trade a lot with, in tandem with corn, which we saw okay. that relationship very strong here this week. Uh, and we'll see how that goes, progresses going forward. Well, and now that leads us right into feeder cattle. Uh, we saw a $4 rise this week, but still a very substantial discount to yeah. the cash trade, to the index. Right. Um, are we going to have to wait until August to, to get that to converge, do you think? If it happens. Uh, that's, that's sort of become the norm okay. lately, you know. Uh, so, yeah, we'd like to see that happen, and we'd like to start to see that happen sooner rather than later, but unfortunately, it's probably going to stay that way for a little while. All right. Well, now let's jump into the lean hog markets. Up $2 this week. Uh, fairly positive move yeah. in the pork complex here. Are we, are we done with a rally here? Was this a, a limited little run-up? It's really tough to see an extended rally in hogs because of the supply-side situation that we have and the fact that demand is just really reluctant to come around and be strong. And especially since we're, we've kind of are passing that peak demand grilling season, if you will. 
so, yeah, it, I think it becomes tough to get a, an extended rally in the Hogs. However, there's a lot of rumblings about uh, the possibility of PEDV coming back again going into the fall and winter months. So I think that's part of the reason why we've been able to stabilize. Uh, we'll see how that develops here over the course of the next few months. If that does come back, uh, then, yeah, we could. May that's when we could maybe see that, that bigger rally. But uh, for now, I think we should be in this, this holding pattern of this really broad range that we've established here over the last three or four months. Mid-60s to upper 70s, yeah, that's right. roughly a $12 range in the hogs. Yeah, right. Now, the rumblings about PED coming back, have there been fresh breaks? No, uh, just the idea that uh, some scientists have talked about the idea that it can re reoccur. There were some specific reasons why it didn't happen last year. Hmm. There can be uh, a scenario where that were to come back. Basically, there, the, the warnings right now are that it might not be gone. We might not have seen it okay. uh, in a big way last year, uh, which was a nice relief, but don't get complacent, don't feel like, okay, this is not a, a non-issue now at this point, uh, because there are some calling for uh, a recurrence of, of what we saw two years ago, basically. Okay, Ted, real quick, before we let you go, oil up or down this next week? Uh, I think a little bit more downside. Eventually, we've got a, a gap to fill uh, to the upside, so we'll take a look at that at some point. Uh, but I think uh, a little bit more pressure going forward. All right. Well, Ted Seifert, thanks for taking the time to join us this week. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Ted and I will continue our discussion and answer more of your questions in our Market Plus segment, only available on our website. You'll also find audio podcasts as well as streaming video of our program exclusively at that Market to Market website. Plus, if you want to interact with us, as I mentioned, check the links to our Twitter and Facebook feeds and send us a message. And join us again when we'll explore how horses are helping veterans readjust to civilian life. So until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.